All right. Second Kings chapter 13. Turn there this morning. Second Kings chapter 13. Um, I want to talk this morning about how to go from hearing a word or a promise from God or having a dream or a vision down to actually seeing it happen in your life. Because it's really important that we don't just kind of have big dreams in God, but we've actually got to see things change and move in the world that we live in. Amen? Five people think that. The rest of you are just happy for your dreams to hang out there and never happen. Right? We've got to see them change and impact the world that we live in. Amen? And, uh, you know, it's important that we look at this and we deal with this world because we're wanting to cultivate an environment here at church where people do hear from God, where they do have dreams and visions, where they get prophetic words, where hope comes into people's hearts. We're wanting to cultivate that kind of environment. So it's really important in cultivating an environment like that, that we are really good at helping people then connect with the next steps to actually see those things come to place. How many know that the Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick? So if we don't deal with it well, then we can end up with people with hope deferred and, and kind of sick hearts. We end up feeling disappointed or end up cynical or, or, or bitter because we've been waiting on something to happen and it hasn't quite happened or it's not happening yet. And we can end up in sick hearts. We don't want sick hearts. And sometimes the reason that things aren't happening is because God is working on his timing and we're working on ours. And uh, I'm the kind of person who likes everything done yesterday. And when I ask, I kind of want an immediate response. Amen, anyone else? Yeah, I'm the only one. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to see things move, and I'm not a particularly patient person, and I've got to remind myself that sometimes in the timing of God, I'm wanting it now, but actually he's wanting it perfect. Yeah. And he's actually building it and pulling it together so when it arrives, it will be perfect. Not just immediate, it's going to be perfect. So, I mean, that, that's how I kind of sometimes feel. But sometimes also, it's not a timing thing, there's, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the start and he's the finish. And in a lot of ways, the dreams and the visions and stuff that we have, they come from God and he begins that process and no one else can start that process. He's the, he's the, the, the author, he's the beginner of it. And then if you've been walking with God for any serious length of time, you'll understand you'll get to a point where you can go no further and then he comes in and he finishes it. He's the author and the perfecter. He's the start and the end of our faith. But between the author and the perfecter, between the start and the end, there's this gap. And this gap is called co-laboring. You see, there's, there's, there's parts that we can't do that he has to do, but then there's other parts that he won't do that we have to do. And that bit in the middle, the co-laboring point, it's so important that we, we get a hold of that and that we work with that part well. And I want to share with you a message this morning that I got on Thursday. Um, as Claire mentioned, we've been at Life Conference this week and it's been brilliant. Um, been so many really good messages and great input for our staff team and, and leadership. It's been really, really good. Um, but it's actually really hard to, um, uh, to get a message for church in the middle of an environment where you're being besieged with all of these great messages hitting you every single day. Because I, you know, I'm not going to share with you a message that I stole and, and you know, refabricated and, and, and passed out this morning. Um, I still wanted to be able to come this morning and say, God, what are you saying to our church at this moment and this time? And be able to be faithful with that. And if you know me well, you'll know that um, generally for me, I get you know, the idea of my message on a Monday and then I kind of you know, work at it over the week and then share it on the Sunday. So for me, sitting there on Thursday in the middle of the conference and I still hadn't got my message, I was starting to get a little like, hmm. I'm not usually this late. <laughs> and so I came out of one of the sessions and I sat down on my notebook and I said, okay, God, I really need to hear from you. And it was interesting, almost immediately, my mind went to a particular scripture and, um, well, to a passage in the Bible. And it's a bit of an odd one. And so anyway, I, I followed it through and opened it up and I started to look at it. And as I read it, I got something out of it that really impacted me. I saw something in it that I'd never seen before. And I thought, not only is this going to be good for me, I think this one's going to be really good for the church. I think it's going to be good for us to hear this this morning. We're going to, we're going to pick some things up from it. So if you are looking for a title this morning, the title of this message, I don't usually have titles, but this one's got a title. This one's called The Flying Arrow and the Grounded Arrow. The Flying Arrow and the Grounded Arrow. And here in 2 Kings chapter 13, we're going to read from verse 14, and it says this. Now when Elisha... That's the great prophet in Israel at the time. When Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, 
Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram. For you shall fight the Arams in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Aram until you had made an end of it. But now you will only strike them down three times. So just as a bit of a backstory here, looking through the history of Israel, they would have one of two kinds of kings in the history of Israel. There was the good kings, and they were the kings that led the people to God and governed well and made sure that the the commands of God and the, the nation of God was rising up and doing well. And unfortunately, there was only a handful of good kings really across all of Israel's history. The rest of them, the rest of the lot were all bad kings. They were evil kings. They basically had their own agenda. They didn't care about God. They didn't care about his ways. They were basically just doing their own thing. And there was a whole lot of bad kings in Israel's time. And unfortunately, Joash was one of the evil ones. He was one of the bad ones. He was not known as a good king. And anyway, Joash is hanging out, I'm guessing, in his palace one day, and he hears this word come to him. Somebody says to him, hey, did you hear that Elisha, the great prophet, is sick? Now, Joash, as far as Scripture tells us, has never had really any dealings with Elisha. We know that he's someone who really had no time for the things of God or anything like that. So I'm sure that Elisha would have been doing his best to kind of try to convince the king, hey, listen, this is what God wants for the nation. And the king would have been spending most of his time just pushing Elisha away. But it comes, this message comes to him. He says, Elisha's sick and about to die. And so Joash the king has this idea. He decides he's going to go and visit Elisha. So he goes down to where Elisha is. And Elisha's there, I'm guessing, kind of on his deathbed. Very sick, close to death. And so the king falls down and over him and starts to cry and wail. He's had no relationship with him. Oh, it's the man of God. And then he says this really interesting phrase. He says, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel which you've got to agree is a bit of a weird thing to come out with. But if you've read the Bible a few times or have been around church for a while, you'll go, hey, I recognize that phrase. I've heard that phrase before. Where have I heard that phrase before? And the place that we've heard that phrase before is actually when Elisha saw Elijah go. So Elijah was kind of like the mentor for Elisha. I know it's Elijah, Elisha. It's pretty confusing. Sometimes the Bible's a bit like this. You know, it got confusing. Now, it's a little bit like Lord of the Rings with Arwen and Eowyn. And, you know, they're both like the same guy. And honestly, I had to watch that thing like five times before I understood anything that was going on. <laughs> Very confusing. But I get it now. It's wonderful now. Once you get it, it's awesome. And this is the same. Once you get it, it's fantastic. So there's Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah had mentioned, mentored Elisha for years. And Elijah had said to Elisha, when I go, I'm going to get taken up into heaven. And when I go, if you see me go, then the power that is on me is going to come on you. And so in that moment, and that's, you know, the chariots of fire, that's where they do, 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 you know. So Elisha gets taken up to heaven with the chariots of fire, and Elisha is there watching it happen. And because he said, if you see me when I'm taken from you, you'll have the power that's on me. In that moment, because of what he sees, he cries out and he says, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. Because he has an encounter, he has a moment, and he wants Elijah to know that he's seen it. And interestingly, at that point, the mantle, the, the, the robe that Elijah was, um, was wearing drops down, and Elisha picks it up, and he strikes the ground with it. And he says, where now is the God of Elijah? And, f- and the waters part, and from that moment, he actually walks in the full power of Elijah going forward. It's pretty cool. But anyway, the reason he said it was because he has this experience. He sees something. And then you've got to think, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, how Weasley is this, really, when you think about it? 
Here's a king who's had like nothing to do with Elisha. He doesn't love God. He's taken the nation in a whole other direction, but he kind of works out, you know what, I'm going to try something on. So he goes down as Elisha is lying on the sickbed. He weeps, oh, I'm the great prophet. You know, I've never really seen you, but you're such a great man. Crying over him. And then he thinks to himself, I'm going to try the magic words. I'm going to say the magic words because when Elisha said this, he got the power on his life. And maybe if I say this too, then I can get his power come on to me. So he's crying and stuff over him. Then he says, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And he's kind of like, you know, waiting in that moment, you know, I'm guessing to get the power that is on Elisha to come on to his life. But how many know that there's a huge difference between revelation and inspiration? I mean, it's good to be inspired. It's good to look around. And so often in life, we're inspired because we see people who are doing things and we want to do what they're doing. We, we, we get inspired by the men and women who are further on than us and whatever it is that we're feeling like we're called to. And we, we want to be like them. And so we look at them and, and, and often what we will do as humans is we will mimic them because we think that if we can mimic them, then we can walk in the same thing that they're walking in. Yeah. Am I speaking to anyone this morning? You see, this is why the internet is full of this whole, you know, of, of articles with, um, read about the four things that Steve Jobs did every morning before he went to work. And the reason that people will read that was, will be because they think that if they do those four things in their morning, then they can walk in the same stuff and have the same degree of success that Steve Jobs did. But how many know that Steve Jobs didn't have success because he did the four things in the morning? He had success because he saw something. He had success because he had a revelation. He saw something. He encountered something. And you see, it's different. When you have a revelation of something, it's like your eyes get opened and suddenly you see. Do you understand that most counseling is actually just about trying to help people have a revelation? Most counseling is actually just talking to a person until they get to the point where they can go, oh, I see. And when they get a revelation, then they change. Inspiration will motivate you, but revelation will change you. And revelation is what we need. You know, the Bible says that faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing and hearing from the Word of God. And I mean, I can stand here this morning and I can read screeds of the Bible to you and you might be inspired. And you might go, man, they're really good words. I like those words. I feel inspired by those words. But how many know it's when, those, when one of those verses leaps off the page and it hits you in the heart and you look and you go, oh my goodness. There's something in that. That's the moment that you get revelation. And when you get revelation, you move from being just an echo to being a voice. And God has called you not in your life just to be an echo. He's not called you as a person just to be a copy of someone else. He's called you to be an original. He made you an original. Don't die a copy. Amen. You know, and so he's not called you just to be a copy or to be an echo. He's called you to be a voice. And how do we become a voice? By walking in revelation. Thank you. I think it's good. You're employed, Mark. <laughs> I'll give you triple what I'm paying you at the moment. <laughs> but you see, he, here's the thing, though. So he's, he's wrapped over Elijah and he's crying, ah, you know, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And you know what? I don't think Elijah, Elisha is stupid to what's going on. You know, he's a pretty smart guy, and when you read about him in other parts of the Bible, you realize that he's, you know, he, he's not, he doesn't tolerate fools. He speaks his mind. And I think it's interesting, because I have to say, if I was Elisha at that point, and somebody who I had kind of spent my life trying to say, hey, listen, don't go in this direction, go that direction, and they had blindly ignored me and led the whole country away in another direction, and they'd kind of rejected everything that I'd said and kind of probably persecuted me across my life. And then on my dying bed, they're suddenly there crying all over me and trying to leech off a little bit of power at the end. I'd be kind of like, you know what? You could take a long walk off a short plank, buddy. <laughs> like, seriously, get out of here. Where have you been all these years? Like, there's no way I'm going to give you anything. You had years to get it, and here you are at the last lap, and now you're looking for it. That's how I would be, but it's interesting though. That's not how Elisha treats him. Elisha moves on to bless him. And I was really challenged by that because, you know, one thing that 
I have seen in my life and I've seen often in the church as well is that we can be very harsh on people when they're coming into the church and when they're coming to faith about their motivations, about why they're here. I mean, Joash, King Joash had rotten motivations, I mean. But guess what? Elisha looks and he goes, yeah, you've got rotten motivations, but you know what? You're here, and in the only way that you know, you're actually calling on God. And so he blesses him. And it really made me think, you know, I just wonder sometimes, as Christians, if we need to be a little less judgy on people's motivations, and we actually just need to be just a little bit more, you know what? Okay, you might even come with a rotten motivation. Who cares? Our Father is good and He loves you. We're going to bless you. Because I think it's interesting, you know, so often in the church, we can be a little bit like, oh, you've come in with a rotten motivation. You're only here just to get something. You're only here to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something. Or, you know, you're only here to basically just kind of get what it is that you can get out of being here. And we can kind of like, you know, go away. And when you have sorted your motivation out, then you can come back. But then, you know, we preach and we say, listen, you don't have to fix yourself before you come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and you get fixed. So do you think that that might also extend to people's motivations as well? How many know that a person's motivation isn't going to get fixed out there? It's going to get fixed in here. Zacchaeus climbs a tree and he's really just looking for his moment in the sun. He's the big guy around town. And if he can get a connection with Jesus, man, that's going to make him look good. But then the moment he gets with Jesus, look at what happens to his motivation. He's like, man, my goodness, God, I've spent my whole life stealing from people and ripping people off. I'm going to give to this. I'm going to change that. The presence of God is what changes people. And so what we've got to do is we've got to clear the way to the presence of God. Listen, if you're here today and you're looking for hope, you're in the right place. You really are. Because the presence of God, God has got what you need for your life. Your life does not, as Claire said, uh, or actually as Emma said, you know, your life doesn't have to be, you know, um, you don't have to live the way that you have always lived. There is hope. There is power here. And so I just love Elisha's response there. And I believe that that's the response that we need to have too. But actually what I want to land on this morning is something that's really powerful in this passage. And I have props. Be afraid. Be very afraid. I didn't hear that, but, you know, um, I'm going to stop paying you right now. I'm not, for the purists out there, I'm not actually going to latch this this morning, um, although it is kind of generally pointed in, in, the, in the area of the young adults and, and, the, and the youth, and we could probably knock a few of them off, and I'm sure none of you would shed any tears anyway, so, no, we love you guys. <laughs> but yeah, my son's actually in the direct firing line here. <laughs> Come on. So anyway, he says, the king says to Joash, he says, take your bow and arrow, and so Joash does it. And he says, point it out the window. And so he does. And then it's really interesting because the Bible says that the prophet then puts his hands on the king's hands. And he says, now stretch it out. And he does. It's all right. (laughs) And he says, shoot. And so anyway, he does. And the arrow starts to fly through the air. And as the arrow is flying through the air, Elisha lets out the shout, and he says, the Lord has given you victory over your enemy. And you know, this is really good news for Joash, because what's happening in Israel at this particular time is that the Aramites that he's talking about, every spring, these guys are coming in, and they are cleaning out Israel of everything, that, all their crops, everything that they've built up every year. Imagine every year you spend all this time building stuff up, and every spring, raiders come in and basically just take the lot. You know exactly what that looks like, Lois, in the country that you... Have you were living in. And uh, actually, if you've ever seen the movie A Bug's Life, anyone ever seen that movie? Yeah. The grasshoppers are the Aramites. The grasshoppers, they just come in and they take everything. They're, they're the Aramites. So for, for Elisha to say to Joash, you're going to get victory over this guy. How many know that's a good word? He's really excited about it. He's thinking, you know what? It was totally worth me coming down, crying crocodile tears and saying, you know, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. If I'm going to get a word like that, this was worth it. Yes. So the arrow is flying through the air. And so he's excited. And then the prophet says this. He says, now I want you to do something else. I want you to take the arrows in your hand and I want you to strike the ground. And so... 
Joash takes the arrows and he gets down and he strikes the ground with the arrows. He's probably thinking to himself, okay, this is a bit weird. I understand like the shooting of the arrow, you know, the striking thing. Probably a prophetic thing, but the last prophecy was pretty good, so I'm just going to roll with this. So he strikes the ground. And maybe he looks up at Elisha and he's waiting. And Elisha's just staring at him. And there's this awkward silence for a moment. And he goes, okay, maybe I didn't do it quite right. So he strikes the ground again. And he's looking at Elisha and there's still no response. And he goes, maybe he didn't see me do it. I'm going to strike the ground. He strikes the ground three times. And he's looking at Elisha and he's waiting and there's no response back. And I'm, I mean, I'm adding obviously to the text here, but he says, he says to him, you know, what am I missing here? And Elisha's like, oh, no. He's like, what? He goes, you only struck the ground three times. If you struck it five or six times, you would have had complete victory over your enemies. But you only struck it three. And so now your victory is only going to be partial. And I have to say, when I've read this in the past, I've felt really bad for the king. I mean, he just said strike the ground. He didn't say... Listen, I'm going to let you in on a secret. The number of times that you strike the ground is the number of times that you so sort of strike the ground. Oh, yeah. And if it was me, it's like, oh, oh, I could do five or six. But the moment's passed. And, you know, when I've read this before, I've been, I have to say I've been a bit confused about it and been a, been a bit kind of like, man, that was a bit, bit kind of mean. But then when I read it on Thursday, suddenly I saw something, and I saw something that I'd never seen before. And it changed the whole perspective and it actually pulled it into the here and now for me and helped me understand something that I hadn't been able to quite put words to before, but this explains it brilliantly. You see, often we come in on Sundays, we come into hothouse environments where the word of God has been preached and where there's prophecy and where there's dreams and visions and we start to get a sense of what it is that God is saying over our lives. And in that environment, it's kind of like we pick up our bows and our arrows, and our arrows represent the, the, the prophecies. They represent the word of God that comes to us. And in those moments, as we, we string them up, we feel the hands of the prophet around us. The worship team's there. The preacher's there saying, come on, you can do it. Saying, God's going to give you victory. Come on, believe again. And in that moment, we, we pull the arrow back and we let it go and it starts to fly. And as the arrows fly and the prophetic word comes, you're going to get victory over your enemies. You're going to see God move in your life. That mountain that you're facing, that thing's going to become like rubble before you. God is going to give you what it is that you're asking for, what you're looking for. And we're filled with faith and we're filled with wonder in that particular moment. It's so good. But then it changes, doesn't it? Because then we have to take the words that are now flying through the air, the promises that are out there and over us that we received in that awesome environment. And we have to take them and we've got to bring them down to the hard reality of our world. The hard, the the difficult soil of where it is that we're living, of what it is that we're doing. And suddenly in that moment, it's not about the arrow flying anymore. It's about grabbing that arrow and bringing it down and saying, I'm going to strike this ground with this arrow. And the problem with this is that, you know, we start to strike, but it's very different, isn't it? Because in the first environment, it's all on for us. We can feel the prophet's hands around us. We feel the the rise of faith in our hearts and it's all on. But here, when we're at home, when we're at work, when we're by ourselves, there's no one else around. And it takes energy, doesn't it, to, to have to keep hitting the ground with these arrows. And so we do it a few times and we kind of look and go, it doesn't feel the same doesn't feel like it's making an impact, doesn't feel like anything's moving. And you know, the prophet rebuked the guy, he rebuked the king, because he said, listen, you only only hit it a few times. And I wonder how many times the words of God that he has spoken over our life have been so close to coming to pass. And yet because we stumble or we we find it difficult to move it out of this kind of environment into our day-to-day and actually see something move, down here every time we're we're hitting the ground. Is this making sense this morning? You see, listen to me. It's not about about how the arrow flies. It's about how the arrow lands. 
It's not about the Word of God that's spoken over your life. It's about the Word of God that gets rooted in your life, that begins to sprout up and actually change. But in order to get to that place, we've got to be able to be prepared to get down in the dust day by day and just keep hitting the ground with the arrows. And so often we just end up giving up. Because listen to me, the, the, the flying arrow is like the preacher on Sunday morning. He's preaching the Word of God and you're like, yeah. But listen to me, the grounded arrow is when the Word of God rises in your heart on Thursday morning when you're facing a giant or you're facing a mountain and you're looking and going, God is with me in this place. The flying arrow is our worship team who lead us in worship, and in that moment, we're experiencing the power and presence of God. But the grounded arrow is when that team stops and the worship that's in your heart starts to come out. Where what's been put on the inside begins to rise. The flying arrow is the ministry team who come along and give you a prophetic word. Or Len Butner, who stands at the front and says, this is what God says over your life. The grounded arrow is when you take that word day by day and you meditate on it and you say, thank you, Jesus. I'm gonna let this thing dwell within me. Are you with me this morning? You know, it's, and it doesn't even just apply to spiritual things. Maybe God's called you to start a business or he's, he's promised you great things ahead for your business. You know, the flying arrow is the promise of God over your business. The grounded arrow are the 37 cold calls that you're going to have to make on, sun, on Monday morning in order to see that business expand. Amen? The flying arrow is the idea of being able to stand in summer with a flat stomach, six pack, and looking good at the beach. The grounded arrow is the ability to resist the chocolate Danish when it comes. <laughs> Amen. I have to say, actually, it's a really good thing that I'm, I'm not at Life Church. It is really, really good that I'm not there. And the reason is because in their cafes, they have these great cafes with this, this excellent coffee, but next to every cafe, they've just got these racks of chocolate Danishes. And if you know me, I mean, chocolate Danishes are like kryptonite for me. I just go weak when I see them. I'm just like, I lose all self-control, all resolve. I'm just like, I'm, I've just got to have one. And uh, you may not know, actually, but for the last four weeks, I haven't been drinking coffee at all. Like, I completely stopped. Don't get too excited. I do this from time to time. Those who know me well are not excited. They're like, you know, this is the latest one. <laughs> it's all good. But you see, because as much as I love coffee, coffee doesn't love me. <laughs> it doesn't help me sleep very well. I actually don't drink that much. I only drink like two cups a day tops. And even if I just drink one cup a day, it still messes with my sleep and sleep apnea and a whole bunch of stuff. So when I come off, I have a week of hell, and then I sleep like a baby. So for the last few weeks, I've been enjoying really, really good sleep, and my wife says, amen. Because, you know. <laughs> but after, what, three days, four days of conference, session after session after session, got to the second to last session, it came out, we had one more session to go, and, well, I just needed a little help. I just need a little push, something just to kind of help me. So I found myself at the coffee stand, ordering myself a flat white. And while I was there at the coffee stand, I looked down and I noticed the rack. And I'd already had one in the morning. And so... Oops. So, anyway, you ever have one of those moments where you've got the angel on one side and the devil on the other? You know, and the angel's saying, don't do it, Peter, don't do it. And on the other side, the devil's like there going, mm, chocolate Danish. But you know what? I was so proud of myself, I resisted. I really did. Yep. I flicked that devil off. I said, no. So anyway, and I'm talking to the girl who's you know, doing the transaction. And she says, is that all? I said, yes, that's all. I'll just have the flat white. Thank you. And then something happened. I don't want to speak evil because it's not, it wasn't really her fault, but Satan entered that girl. <laughs> and this is what happened, I kid you not. Because she, she'd seen me looking at the... <laughs> and she, she, she looks at me and she says this, she goes, you know they're still warm on the inside. <laughs> And I'm like, no! And then something happened. I don't, I, I, it happened fast. I just, I was, I was merely a, a witness. I, the, the thing's going into a bag and coffee's arriving and my FPOS card is swiping and 
I don't know. I mean, a few minutes later, you know, I, I found myself there with the coffee and with this thing, that, and I don't even know how it happened. It just, I'm there, and I turn around, and there's my wife standing right there. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. She said, you're not supposed to be drinking coffee. And I'm like, I know I'm not. And what's that? That's a chocolate Danish. My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. I have been thinking, though. I don't think it would be terribly hard for us to just, you know, next to the coffee machine there. We'll just put a little cabinet. And just, you know, I'm thinking just things that go well with coffee and hot chocolates and stuff. You know, just... You know, just... Get behind me, Satan! I, d I, I don't know. Oh, well, well, actually, actually... I would like to say, in my defense, no, no, yeah, yeah. I, I carved what I consider to be a reasonably generous proportion off, probably, probably about that much, off the end, and I gave it to my children. So actually, I did not eat the whole Danish. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the book of Exodus, Moses is up on the mountain with God, and God shows him this, this plans for the temple and for the tabernacle. And, uh, and he, he has this experience up there of what God wants to build. And then Moses says, sorry, God says to Moses, now I want you to go down, and what you have seen on the mountain, I want you to build for me down with the people. And so he goes down the mountain, he comes down the mountain, and he can't do it by himself, so he has to pull all of these people in. Oholiab and um, Belazel and, you know, the whole team and stuff. So there's craftsmen, there's silversmiths, there's goldsmiths, there's uh, metal workers, there's sewers, there's carpenters. Everybody's busy building this particular thing. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because when you're up on the mountain, things just look so awesome. But then sometimes when you're actually back down on the ground and the arrow's hitting the ground and the metal worker's there banging away at this thing which is going to become part of the house of God. Are you with me? And it's hot and it's tiring. It gets easy to give up. But they did it. They pulled all of this stuff together. And then Moses and Aaron walk into that. And as they walk out to bless the people, the fire of God comes out. It lights the brazen altar and the presence of God falls on the people and they have an encounter with God. He was the author and he was the perfecter, but they had to be faithful with the middle. God is the author of your life. He's the perfecter of your life, but you've got to be faithful with the middle. You've got to... We've got to get good at taking the prophetic words and the promises and the dreams and taking them from being the flying arrows around us and let them start to become the grounded arrows in our life. And what does that look like? And this is what I just want to finish off with this morning because this was my little jaw-dropping moment. And I thought this was pretty cool. You see, the man of God was upset with the king because he only struck the ground three times. He said, if you'd done it five or six, you would have had victory over the Aramites. You would have had complete victory. Only, only, you only did three. And so I was pondering this and thinking about five and six. Five and six. And here's my little insight. I wouldn't say this is, you know, absolute word of God stuff, but this is just an insight, a thought. We have five working days, and there's six days between Sunday and Sunday. What would it be like, I wonder, you know, if we move to the place where instead of kind of hearing something awesome on a weekend or at a conference or on a podcast or something, and we just go and we just do it a couple of times and have a little bit of a victory, but we don't see the thing really move. What would it be like if instead we said on Monday, thank you God for your word. I'm going to let this word impact my life. On Tuesday, thank you, God, for this word. I'm going to let this word impact my life. On Wednesday, thank you, God, for this word. I'm going to let this word impact my life. On Thursday, thank you, God, for this word. I'm going to let this word impact my life. On Friday, thank you, God, for this word. I'm going to let this word impact my life. On Saturday, thank you, God, for this word. I'm going to let this word impact my life. So that by the time we come back to Sunday, we're not kind of coming back going, oh, I need another touch me from God. We're walking back going, I'm seeing heaven change my world. Stuff shifting in my life because it's no longer just the flying arrow, it's the grounded arrow now. 
It's, it's hitting my life. It's hitting my world. I wonder if the worship team, if our guys could just come this morning. Why don't we just stand to our feet as we finish up this morning? And here's what I want to ask you today. Just why don't you just stand to your feet right now? Here's what I want to ask you this morning. I wonder what the arrows are that are flying around your life right now. What are those words? What are those promises? What are those dreams? The things that maybe have been starting to make even your heart sick because you're like, I don't even know how to keep hanging on to these things. I just want you to think about those things this morning. What is it that God has spoken about your life? What is the promises? Just close your eyes and just think about that for a moment. Just think about you right now. What has God spoken to you about? What has he promised you? What has he said to you? And Father, I thank you this morning, Lord, that you're calling us. Lord, I thank you for the word that you speak over us, God, for the, for the way that you impact us. But Lord, I thank you also this morning, Lord, that you're calling us, Lord, to grab a hold of those things and to start to see them impact our day to day. And so I'm praying this morning, Lord, I'm asking God for the strength that is needed in this moment, in this moment when the prophet's hands are on us, in this moment where we're in that zone, Lord, and, and we can feel your presence here. I'm asking God that you would fill us with faith and you would fill us with strength this morning. Come on, church. I'm asking, Lord, you fill us with faith and strength this morning. Lord, that it would move from just being an arrow that flies through the air to becoming an arrow that hits the ground, that begins to shake and move and change our lives. And look, this morning, I just want to give you an opportunity to respond right now. If you're in that place and you know that there's some arrows that are flying around over your head and you're like, okay, yeah, you know what? I've been hearing what you're saying, Peter. I need to bring these things down and I need to actually start to strike the ground with them. Why don't you just lift your hands right where you are? Right where you are. And you're not doing this for me. You're doing this for God. You lift your hands up to Him. And what I want you to do this morning is, is in your heart, just make a fresh commitment to Him today. Say, Lord, okay, as I walk out of this place, Lord, I thank you for the promises that you've spoken over my life, Lord, but I'm gonna see those things grounded. I thank you for those arrows that are flying through the air, Lord, but tomorrow morning, Father, help me to take that word and to put it into action. Lord, on Tuesday, help me to take that word and put it into action every single day, five days, six days, again and again and again until that word begins to take root and it begins to change and move. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for every hand that is lifted right now. I ask for phenomenal grace and power to come towards these people, that even as they've got their hands lifted this morning, they would feel the presence of God in this place and know that the power of heaven is with them, that you are energizing them, Lord, to be able to run the race with confidence and never look back. Thank you this morning, God, for change coming in these lives of the hands that are lifted. And you know, just as I finish off this morning, you can just put your hands down now. I also want to give one other response. You see, I'm, I'm stunned by what Elisha did there because his response to someone who really deserved nothing from him was to bless him. His response to someone who'd spent his entire life pushing him away was to bless him. And you know what? I don't know everyone here this morning. I don't know where you've come from. Maybe you've gave, you've never given your life to the Lord or maybe you did years ago, but you've kind of drifted. Maybe you don't even know where you are this morning, but I wanna tell you something, and this is the truth, that your heavenly Father wants to bless you today. As we come to Him with hearts and arms wide open, he is ready to meet us in that place, just like Elisha did. And guess what? You know, it's His kindness that leads us to repentance, amen? When we experience the goodness and the kindness of God, we quickly start to leave behind the old life because we look and say, you know what? I just don't wanna live there anymore. I don't wanna keep doing that stuff because it just leads me to death. Today, I'm gonna to make a decision for life. Today, I'm gonna to make a decision, God, to give my heart to you and to get my life on track. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on a cross like that. He poured out every last bit of His blood for you and for me. And He did that. He paid a price that He didn't owe because we owed a price that we couldn't pay. He did that for us to connect us with God and to be able to enable us to live for Him and to see His blessing and His life come into our life. So with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, Christians, I want you to pray right now. I just wanna give an opportunity. If you need to get your life right with God today, if you need to come back home to Him today, if you need to come and actually put your life in His hands, I wanna give you that opportunity this morning. 
whether or not you've ever done this before or you've done it a hundred times before, who cares? Even if you've been walking with God for 40 years and everyone thinks you're the most spiritual person in the world, if you need to get your life right with the Lord this morning, don't delay. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm just gonna ask right now, because I wanna invite you to come and I wanna pray for you this morning, but I'm just gonna ask you firstly just to raise your hands. Is there anyone here this morning that know, and you'll know on the inside if I'm speaking to you. Just would you just slip your hand up right now so I can identify you. Who is in that place today? You just know that you've got to get your life right with Jesus this morning. Is there anyone here? Come on. Just in this moment right now, I'm not going to hold it open for long. Is there anyone here today and you just know that today is your day? This is your moment. Father, I just thank you this morning, Lord God, for your incredible grace towards us. Lord, even when we continue to fall, Lord, you are faithful to get around us and to pick us up and to give us strength to rise again. And I'm asking, Lord, for every single one of us that we would see change start to come as we move from the flying arrow, Lord, to the grounded arrow. See that change.